In Greek mythology, Astraea, daughter of Zeus and Themis, was the goddess of justice. She is represented with a pair of balances in her hand and a crown of stars. She was the last of all the goddesses who left the earth when the golden age had passed away and men began to forge weapons and commit acts of violence. And I am very curious by this Astraea character. The, the legends of the ancients identified her with Astraea, the goddess of justice. The Egyptians credited her with forming the Milky Way by scattering wheat heads through the sky. And if that wasn't enough, Back in the day, she was uh, back in the 1800s. She was considered one of the planets, and in our solar system, there was 20 planets: Neptune, Astraea, Hebe, Iris, Floetis, Hygieia, Penelope, and much more. I wonder what happened to them all, and to Astraea, and but especially what happened to the Golden Age. Can we bring it back? A mid 1800s article claims music helps flowers is needed in their daily diet, says horticulturists. Flowers will retain their original bloom for many days if subjected to the rhythmic strains of music, according to F.C. Billings, musician and horticulturist of Milwaukee. I have tried music on flowers and I know it will work. He says flowers must have music in their daily diet for certain atmospheric waves set up by the rhythmic musical tones have a beneficial effect similar to light waves. Professor C.A shell of the plant physiology department of the university of chicago said that as yet there is not scientific basis for saying positively sound waves do affect plants in the way they do animals but it is a line of experimentation which will be taken up immediately if the proposed plant research institute is established in the university and we all know that music does wonders for us so why wouldn't it do wonders for the plants they are surrounded by frequencies they are surrounded by light just like us of course they take it in embrace it and love it an article from 1847 called Plowing with Elephants was pretty interesting. It is stated that in Ceylon, elephants are employed in plowing rice fields and in preparing new grounds for cultivation of coffee, pepper, etc. One of these animals, well trained, it is said will do the work of 20 oxen. Consequently, more labor is performed in a given time and the period is hastened for putting in the crops. The price of an elephant in Ceylon varies from $50 to $75 at this time. Very interesting, and we also know that they used elephants for war, they used elephants for construction, I'm sure. So elephants were like the machines, and I wonder if inevitably back in the past, animals were crafted by the creators to be machines. But I don't know, who knows, the creator has a lot in store and we don't know. But very interesting how they used to use elephants so much, and they still do, but not in this part of the world. We got rid of them and can't even see them at zoos now. This paper talks about a chemical experiment on Mount Vesuvius where a singular experiment or rather result has lately been announced as obtained by M. Gimbernath, a learned Spaniard who is now counselor to the King of Bavaria. He ascended the summit of Vesuvius on December 4th, 1818 and placed on one of the fumaroles of the craters an apparatus for condensing the vapor. By this means he obtained a somewhat considerable quantity of clear distilled water which tasted of fat or grease and smelt strongly of burnt animal substances. The chemical test to which this liquid showed that it was clearly not fr it was free of acid and not sulfuric acid. He is of the opinion that it is saturated with the matter partaking of the nature of animal matter. Should this opinion prove to be well founded, it will afford ample occasion to question how can animal matter have supported such intense combustion during so many ages? Can fresh supplies furnish additional fuel from time to time? And whence come they? Must we go back to the opinions of the ancients and again talk of the giants and titans? I may have found the inspiration for the Brady Bunch. The New York Dispatch, May 10th, 1857. Extraordinary marriages. The following extraordinary occurrence took place in London. A gentleman, a widower, left with three sons, became acquainted with a widow lady who had three daughters. The lady and gentleman married, and with the children of the two families, lived together for ten years. During the last six weeks, the sons and daughters were married to each other, and what is the most singular, the eldest son married the eldest daughter, the others in the same manner. I wonder if this story actually lingered through time and became the Brady Bunch, or became an idea for the Brady Bunch, or how often this has happened. 1857? I love looking at these old newspapers because you never know what is going to happen, and whether they're funny, or they're interesting, or they're fascinating, they're always pretty much all of the above, and there's some weird stuff that happened in the past. Stay tuned for more. 
November 14th, 1869, there is no need to dwell upon the methods or details whereby fraudulent voting is accomplished, more especially in our populous cities. The entry of fictitious names upon the poll lists and the repeating of votes by organized gangs of men answering to such names, the issue of fraudulent naturalization papers to newly arrived foreigners, the personation of deceased or absent voters by disqualified persons registering under their names or by their papers, all these forms of abuse and corruption of the franchise are known to the public. Constitutional provisions, legislative enactments, police authority have alike failed to reach and cure the evil. Legal measures are powerless. Moral means are unavailing. It is time that we resort to mechanical preventatives. And again, remember, this isn't 2020. This is November 1869. The problem is still here. It hasn't gone anywhere. That means they don't care and they want it to continue. Sometime in the late 1800s, there was an incidence where bears outsmarted bees, and I'm sure it was common in a lot of places, but wallow in rosin and mud to guard against stings during forays. In Whitehall, New York, December 5th, the bears at Ghost Hollow, north of here, have learned to smear their bodies with rosin from pine trees and then wallow in mud before invading the numerous beehives for honey. Bees can't sink their stingers through such armor as that. And I just found this kind of interesting because it's, uh, you know, the animals always kind of find the natural methods, just like the primitive kind of people that live in a lot of different places or people just in general, I'm sure. But so many, that's why so many tribes learn from the animals. They watch the animals to learn things. So many of our medicines were taken from tribes or from different animals and different insects and things that have certain capabilities. So I just found it interesting and hope you do too. Love the animal kingdom. Bless you all. March 5th, 1864, Ancient Pyramid in California. Another of those numerous evidences of a civilized antiquity in the New World has just turned up, it seems, in the shape of a great stone pyramid, composed of courses from 18 inches to nearly 3 feet in thickness and 5 to 8 feet in length. It has a level top of more than 50 feet square, though it is said to be evident from the remains that it was once completed. This pyramid differs in some respects from the Egyptian pyramid, being more slender or pointed and the outer surface of the blocks being out to an angle that gave the structures, when new and complete, a smooth or regular surface from top to bottom. And it makes me wonder what was at the top and how many pyramids were there and what was the prime like, obviously, but what was on top? Probably some tech, maybe a ceremonial place, but definitely something elaborate, ancient, and perfect. Beautiful, and with a power and presence and purpose we still don't know, but we will find out. Catacombs of Egypt. These depositories of Egypt's embalmed dead are of immense extent and are supposed by Mr. Buckingham to contain more bodies than there are people now living on the globe, slash plain. These mummies are now wholly destitute of any animal matter. It has all changed into a resinous substance or decayed. They are taken from the catacomb to be exported and to be used for fuel. The finest are exported whole as objects of curiosity from museums. Certain parts, as the inside of the head and chest, are sold as a drug, and the backbone is ground into powder for a paint, which is highly prized by artists. I wonder what that drug was like to come from the parts of a chest of a mummified Egyptian from thousands of years ago, potentially, or what color it produced when it was ground into a powder for a paint. But it's crazy that they would use such treasures for such trivial things. But that's the way it works after a reset. Bless you all. Mid-1800s, a correspondent of the London Athenaeum writing from Egypt states that the destruction of the ancient temples and pyramids is rapidly going on. He says the northern pyramid of Dashur is now in progress of being converted into a stone quarry in order to build some new palace in the neighborhood. The tombs of the blah are used for the same purpose. The monument of the mound of Abidus are ransacked for building materials. The temples of Ermen is going for the same purpose, and two temples have have within the last six years been knocked down and the materials removed from near Sheikh Fadi, entirely without the knowledge of travelers, to whom indeed they have remained utterly unknown until now that they no longer exist. I went to Skmin, Sikmin to look at the great block of stone copied by Wilkinson and supposed to be restored by Latrone. I found that the first line was entirely gone. They are breaking up the block to make lime. And how many beautiful relics were destroyed before anyone even had a clue.
January 1907, news of the discovery of manuscripts in Central Asia, at least one in an unknown tongue, raises some hope of solving the great historical riddle of the Tartar Empire. We have reason to suppose that in high antiquity, Central Asia was dominated by a Tartar race of considerable civilization. Sven Hedin and other travelers have found great cities half buried in the sands of Turkestan, relics apparently of the race that overran Russia and actually conquered China, but so far we are quite without literary documents of these people, being dependent for their history on the testimony of their enemies. We seem to trace their influence in the designs on textiles and ceramics in Central and Western Asia, but such evidence is naturally of a slight and dubious kind. It has been hoped that the Pumpley expedition would throw some light on these matters, but so far preliminary surveys have revealed chiefly the remains of very primitive peoples. But remember, Turkestan was once a prime spot on the Silk Road in a main part of Tartary. The human figure from an 1850s newspaper for all the artists out there. The proportions of the human figure are strictly mathematical. The whole figure is six times the length of the foot. Whether the form be slender or plump, the rule holds good. Any deviation from it is a departure from the highest pro beauty of proportion. The Greeks made all their statues according to this rule. The face from the highest point on the forehead where the hair begins to the chin is one tenth of the whole stature. The hand from the wrist to the middle of the finger is the same. From the top of the chest to the highest point in the forehead is a seventh. If the length of the face from the roots of the hair to the chin be divided into three equal parts, the first division determines the place where the eyebrows meet and the second the place of the nostrils. The height from the feet to the top of the head is the same as the distance from the extremity of the finger when the arms are extended. We are a miracle of beautiful, perfect creation and design. Bless you all. I covered this in a video as a tiny little article, but mushroom beer. Ancient Mexicans used to indulge in an intoxicating brew called Tio Nanacato during certain festivals. The drink was made from a special kind of mushroom. So special that they made all kinds of artworks and different things relating to it. And when I think of this, I think of just the power that these things have. And if you've taken them, you know what it's about. And then you think about them as being a natural occurrence and things that grow. And you know, maybe the spores came from beyond the poles or beyond this realm. But either way, when you, if you were to have a society that drank this instead of cola, or instead of beer that just does nothing and makes you kind of your body get destroyed, you would have a civilization that could go anywhere, that knew no limits, that their conceptions of reality would expand into multiple dimensions, so much different than our Hollywood cultured nonsense world that we live in. Get me some Mexican mushroom beer, I want it. Found in an early 1900s paper, the walls of Paris disappearing, apartment houses and parks taking place of masonry, the walls of Paris, those stern fortifications which served to shelter the French capital for centuries, maybe thousands of years, are fast disappearing from view as the huge masonry is daily pulverized by leveling machines. Apartment houses and new boulevards and parks are growing in their place. Since the first break was made in 1919, a total of 340,000 cubic meters have been torn down and 3 million cubic meters of land have been reclaimed at a cost of 30 million francs. And I wonder why they started to do this around 1919. They're just destroying stuff everywhere. The, de the depression is happening in America and they're just like, oh, let's just rebuild and destroy all these amazing, beautiful things that we'll never be able to build again. Seems a little odd. I wonder. Reset. An article from 1847 called Plowing with Elephants was pretty interesting. It is stated that in Ceylon, elephants are employed in plowing rice fields and in preparing new grounds for cultivation of coffee, pepper, etc. One of these animals, well trained, it is said will do the work of 20 oxen. Consequently, more labor is performed in a given time and the period is hastened for putting in the crops. The price of an elephant in Ceylon varies from 50 to 75 dollars at this time. Very interesting and we also know that they used elephants for war, they used elephants for construction I'm sure, so elephants were like the machines and I wonder if inevitably back in the past animals were crafted by the creators to be machines but I don't know, who knows, the creator has a lot in store and we don't know but very interesting how they used to use elephants so much and they still do but not in this part of the world. We got rid of them and can't even see them at zoos now.
Sal Ammoniac Volcanoes. A traveler quotes a passage from the Chinese Encyclopedia. I would like to get our hands on that, which describes two active volcanoes in the interior of Tartary from which the Sal Ammoniac is obtained by the Tartars and distributed in the way of commerce. There are caverns in these volcanoes in which a greenish liquid collects, which when exposed to the air changes into a salt. One of these mountains is called Tursan, or the Hill of Fire, and the other Hotibion, or Town of fire. A column of smoke continually rises from the former, which in the night becomes a flame, similar to that of a flambeau. Birds and other animals illuminated by it appear of a red color. Sabata or wooden shoes are worn by those who collect the salt, for leather shoes would soon be burnt. The people of the neighborhood also collect the mother waters, which they put in vessels and obtain the salamoniac in lumps or loaves, like those of common salt. Very interesting. Mid-1800s. Wow found this in an old 1800s newspaper and I thought this was funny and you occasionally come across these little blips of articles that end up being pretty cool and this one said sneeze gas used. Sneeze gas is being used to route stowaways from the holds of ships at Manila. More than a dozen men recently were driven off one ship by the gas. I wonder what they made that of and what, make, what could make you sneeze and what were they putting into the air? Where did they get it from? Probably a plant or some kind of thing. I'm not really sure, but rooting out stowaways. What a world that was. And then also at the end, of, right next to that clip, also had another one that said, Oranges and lemons are believed to contain a higher percentage of stored sunlight than any other fruits. thought that was pretty interesting to refer to it that way probably word off scurvy too while we're in the boat topic but either way just another random thing from the past and just showing our old world and where we came from bless you all Oscar Newman's underground city beneath Manhattan. The architect and city planner Oscar Newman, better known for his dreadful defensible space theory, also fostered in 1969 the bizarre possibility of clearing out with nuclear explosions a massive underground sphere beneath Manhattan. The hollowed space would then be occupied by people and all kinds of different commercial ventures. And what an interesting concept. Although I guarantee the underground of New York is already pretty elaborate and complex. But to think that people were thinking of interesting ideas like this and just willy-nilly using nuclear explosions to do it. And even the fact that they consider it under the New York City. Or maybe this guy was just a quack with a radical little vision that was also kind of futuristic and somewhat cool and maybe ancient as well. Who knows? I just found it interesting. Hope you do too. Bless you all. This article is from May 25th, 1894, and it says, The voices of nations, the Tartars, are supposed to have, as a nation, the most powerful voices in the world. The Germans possess the lowest voices of any civilized people. The voices of both Japanese and Chinese are of a very low order and feeble compass and are probably weaker than any other nation. Taken as a whole, Europeans have stronger, clearer, and better voices than the inhabitants of the other continents, except the Tartars, who are supposed to have the most powerful voices in the world. So I wonder if things like opera and other things like that have originated from Tartarian things or uh, Gregorian chant or different things like that. If they're supposed to have the most powerful voices in the world, they must have a history of some really amazing feats of singing. I wonder what those sounded like. Probably incredible. Bless you all. Early 1800s paper talks about a chemical experiment on Mount Vesuvius where a singular experiment or rather result has lately been announced as obtained by M. Gimbernath, a learned Spaniard who is now counselor to the King of Bavaria. He ascended the summit of Vesuvius on December 4th, 1818 and placed on one of the fumaroles of the craters an apparatus for condensing the vapor. By this means he obtained a somewhat considerable quantity of clear distilled water which tasted of fat or grease and smelt strongly of burnt animals animal substances. The chemical test to which this liquid showed that it was clearly not fr it was free of acid and not sulfuric acid. He is of the opinion that it is saturated with the matter partaking of the nature of animal matter. Should this opinion prove to be well founded, it will afford ample occasion to question how can animal matter have supported such intense combustion during so many ages? Can fresh supplies furnish additional fuel from time to time? And whence come they? Must we go back to the opinions of the ancients and again talk of the giants and titans?
From a late 1850s Scientific American, the sky, an indicator of the weather, the color of the sky at particular times affords wonderful good guidance. Not only does a rosy sunset presage good weather and a ruddy sunrise bad weather, but there are other tints which speak with equal clearness and accuracy. A bright yellow sky in the evening indicates wind, a pale yellow wet, a neutral gray color constitutes a favorable sign in the evening and an unfavorable one in the morning. The clouds are again full of meaning in themselves. If their forms are soft, undefined, and full feathery, the weather will be fine. If their edges are hard, sharp, and definite, it will be foul. Generally speaking, any deep, unusual hues betoken wind and rain, while the more quiet and delicate tints bespeak fair weather. These are simple maxims, and, not, and yet not so simple, but that the British Board of Trade has thought fit to publish them for the use of seafaring men. Very interesting, and I love looking at clouds in a beautiful sunset. This is for all the brickers out there. Wedding bricks from a mid-1800s article. Few people except builders are aware of the advantages of wedding bricks before laying them. A wall 12 inches thick built up with good mortar with brick well soaked is stronger in every aspect than one 16 inches thick built dry. The reason this is that if the bricks are saturated with water, they will not abstract from the mortar the moisture which is necessary to its crystallization, and on the contrary, they will unite chemically with the mortar and become as solid as a rock. On the other hand, if the bricks are put up dry, they immediately take all the moisture from the mortar, leave it too dry to harden, and the consequence is that when a building of this description is taken down of its own accord, the mortar falls from it like so much sand. I wonder how much sand that we have in this world came from buildings in different structures of the ancient capacity that are now just rendered rock or sand because of the brick in its style and way it was built. Who knows? In the mid-1850s, two students spending their summer holidays among the Yorkshire hills happened to survey one morning the rugged slope of the great Ingleboro Mountain through their field glasses. They saw, half hidden among the bracken, a narrow slit in the rock. They blasted away a couple of thousand tons of limestone, and in the heart of the mountain discovered a roaring river passing through crystal caves. In lofty chambers, curtailed with stalactites of orange and white crystal are cascades of clear water which have splashed down for countless ages. At one point the riverbed widens out and forms a long subterranean lake. This portion is not yet opened up but excavation is being carried on. Wow, I would absolutely love to just explore the inner workings of this beautiful hollow earth. There seems to be so many things just trapped in the mountains, so much history explaining our origins and our amazing past. All trapped. Let's dig. June 1901. This prehistoric dwarf had 200 teeth. While a crew of stone laborers were working on an excavation through the Fortman Cliff, two miles east of Newport for the bed of the Tennessee and North Carolina Railroad, they found a human female skeleton 19 inches in height, in a perfect state of preservation. The only anomaly was the teeth, which were 200 in number and had no sockets, but were developed from and grew upon the jawbone with no adjacent valvular process. The bones were hermetically sealed and sent to the Smithsonian Institution. The skeleton was found in solid rock 10 feet from face and 8 feet from top of cliff in a cavity 2 feet by 15 inches. About the cavity was no opening, crevice, or aperture for the skeleton to enter since the formation of the cliff more than 2,000 years ago. So what was this? A dwarf thing? A doll? A relic? an old farmer midget dwarf magic human a fairy thanks to the smithsonian we'll never know july 1926 women's rights well established in tibet marriage in tibet is not the least interesting of the customs of that remarkable country writes an exploring globe trotter in a british paper reported by the atlanta constitution as a rule it takes place only in families possessed of wealth and social position according to the laws of tibet the eldest brother has the right first right to marry since he alone inherits the ancestral property but if there are brothers the bride is shared by them as by so many junior husbands on the day of the wedding, the bride is barricaded in her home. Long arguments in which the whole village takes a part over the profitableness of the marriage are indulged in through a hole in the door. Finally, a scarf is waved as a sign of surrender and the gates are opened. The bridegroom's mother then hands out sour milk and cakes to the guests and the ceremonies begin. The Tibetan woman is very much the head of the household. The men must bring their earnings to her. When they need money, they must ask for it. A husband who is idle too long is liable to be reprimanded or even divorced. 
January 1912, the tragedy of Earth and two Skeeters. After lying dormant in larvae for 60 million years, sure, two mosquitoes were born in Washington a day or so ago, like Jurassic Park. Also, it being ascertained that they were yellow fever mosquitoes, just like the ones found in Central America, yesterday they were immediately executed. Some time ago, Assistant Secretary of State Alvi Aidy received a curious prehistoric deposit from Brazil. Mr. Aidy is a chemist, and in analyzing the rock, found two minute larvae. This astonished Mr. Aidy greatly, and he sent the embryonic animals to the Agricultural Department for further scientific investigation. Under treatment, the larvae promptly developed into magnificent mosquitoes. As the larvae were found in the interior of the rock, and Smithsonian Institution experts regard the age of anywhere between 60 million to 200 years old, the minimum figure has been adopted as the probable age of the Brazilian mosquitoes that they immediately put to death millions and millions and hundreds of millions of years ago. Trust us. April 1901 is a hideous relic, strong iron cage containing human skeleton to be sold to the Smithsonian. It is the only specimen of the old barbarous habit of chain hanging ever found in America, and one of the few now to be found in the world. This cage was discovered in an unexpected way by a lot of men in King George County, Virginia, while working a roadbed. It is almost an exact reproduction of some of those used in England from 1340 to 1834, at which, at which time this species of barbarism was abolished. Although six feet in length, this cage looks not unlike a huge rat trap. And so apparently, whenever a crime was committed of a somewhat serious nature, they would put the criminal in a cage and leave him in the spot where the crime was committed until he turned into bones. And then people would learn their lesson. Quite an old method of punishment and interesting that they found it in America and it was rarely there or heard of. 1300s? Who knows what time or who this was from, but yikes. February 1924. This is an interesting uh, advertisement. It says, read this. Look for the moon. Never slip. Remains of human beings with teeth like horses have recently been excavated from Burton Mound, California by John P. Harrington, ethnologist of the Smithsonian Institution. Of all the skeletons taken from the prehistoric Indian burying ground, not one has been found with a cavity in the teeth, says the dentist. The Indians, he says, use their teeth as a third hand, which accounts for the enormous development. Modern man is less fortunate. His teeth are subject to decay, but with proper care, they can be made to last as long as the Indians. <laughs> are you keeping up with the time? This is very interesting because I always wondered if the ancients had better teeth than us. I wonder if it's because we now have places like this all over the place and our food is absolute garbage and we have movies like this and entertainment encourages it to constantly do that. I think that was a thing that was not common in the ancients. February 1893. She is black one year and white the next. A woman appeared in Canton, Mississippi Friday who attracted much attention. She has perfectly white face and hands and short kinky hair and with the features of a Negro. The woman said that she was born black and remained so until she was 15 years old when she suddenly turned white, remaining so for one year when she turned black again. Since that time she is alternately white and black, not alone in spots, but changes color entirely. She is fairly intelligent and says she has never had a spell of sickness and has never taken a dose of medicine. She lives near Salis Station on the Canton and Aberdeen Road. She says she cannot stand the sun at all and wears a double veil and heavy gloves. She says if the sun shines in her skin for one minute, it causes it to blister at once. She has been examined by physicians who are unable to account for the change in her color. What the heck is this story all about? It seems like it's pretty legit, but you never know, I guess. Can we ever trust the news? And could we ever? Who knows? July 1928, huge flying snake dug up in Oregon. Discovery of the remains of a gigantic reptile with a wing spread equal to that of a modern airplane that flew freely over the earth in the prehistoric past was announced yesterday by the Smithsonian Institution, which can't always be trusted. The fossil of the giant pterosaur is found recently on the rocks on the coast of Oregon and brought here to the National Museum for study led to the finding that monstrous snakes flew about in the ages before birds took to the air. The place in which the bones were found, scientists say, proved that the flying reptile lived in the period of reptilian domination of the earth. Three great groups of backboned animals have attained flight. They say birds, mammals, and reptiles. The bat is the most successful mammalian flyer, although tree shrews and flying squirrels have developed a fairly efficient sailing or gliding mechanism. The flying reptile must have been powerful in flight. The scientists point out their massive wing mechanism is believed to have that of a bat in structure, not believed they had feathers. Huh. Wonder if it's true. 
January 1907, the largest bell in the world is found at the Tenoji Temple at Osaka. It was made during the 1905 exposition that was held in Osaka, when 10,000 Buddhist priests were present, which is one-tenth of the total number in the empire. Report went forth that following an ancient custom, a young maiden was wanted to propitiate the gods by throwing herself into the molten metal, and a young woman really presented herself as an offering, but of course the authorities would not permit the sacrifice. This bell, which is second to the broken bell at Moscow in size, was made of gifts of swords and ornaments in money and has a tone of more than ordinary richness. All Buddhist temples contain large bells and their sound is soft, deep, and musical. I wonder what happened during the, and what power they expected to get from this by sacrificing a young maiden. And in general, what the true purpose of these bells were, we may never know, but I hope we figure it out because I bet it is impressive. Bless you all. January 1914, this huge beast once roamed the U.S. Giant ground sloth skeleton dug from the La Brea Asphaltum beds near Los Angeles, California. Note the size of the great beast compared with the man beside it. Many specimens of the prehistoric animal life of this continent are being excavated daily in this bed. All the bones are wonderfully well preserved on account of the chemical qualities of the asphalt. The theory is advanced that in the beginning, the animals thought the great lake of molten asphalt was water and waded into it, either to drink or wallow, and were trapped by the treacherous bog and were mired to their death. Specimens of giant birds as well as other animal life have been found. And this is pretty amazing how they, uh, they say that a lot of these were found in South America, but these things were all over the place. And they always try to delude the story with uh, the dinosaurs, but they never talk about just the absolute massive beasts of all different kinds that were everywhere in America. Pittsburgh, April 1891, the transforming mirror. It makes the dying man look like the robust athlete. There is a mirror in a window on F Street placed at such a skillful angle with the sidewalk that passersby can't help feeling their own reflection walking towards them. By another equally adroit arrangement of a triplicate mirror, the images of people traveling both ways are caught in the long glass. Hardly a woman passes, but she takes a quick peep at her gown and hat. The mirror is almost magical, for it seems to glorify all who look in it. Not only women, but men use it, and it was a sickly-looking man, almost ready for the translation, that stood before it a day or two ago. That he was looking at his own reflection with almost satisfaction was easy to see. His face was white and marked with fatal sickness, while while the reflection was fairly startling with its glow of health. The man looked at it as if he had seen hope. Then a pretty blooming girl's face appeared behind him, and when the man saw that he seemed to be but the weak invalid again, and turned away with only the death-like pallor in his eyes. Poor guy. Timeless Tartarian aphorisms from a book called The Hundred Councils from 750 or I-350. And you may have heard some of these before, and I wonder if they originated from the Tartarians. Here we go. Oh, dear friends, make the most of life. Do not defer until tomorrow the pleasure of today. Sounds familiar. Profit by the present, for life will not return a second time. Uh, so far as you are able, refrain from speaking the truth so that you may not be a bore to other people and that they may not be vexed with you without due cause. That's pretty necessary today, I guess, although we must speak the truth. And then also, do not believe the words of pious and learned men, lest you go astray and fall into hell. And then despise not ribaldry, nor regard satirists with the eye of scorn. If these common sayings came from Tartaria, I wonder what else did. The river of Nile was not navigable by reason of the great number of rocks that are in it, and that from the same island forward, ships might easily sail and pass. When being asked of Ethiopia, which is of the Indias of Prester John, upon the said river and those that here were speak of that we speak of reported that those people of Ethiopia are commonly of a longer life than we are of, and many of them live a hundred and fifty years, and in some places two hundred. They never have the pestilence nor other infirmities, and that therefore it is be a populous country. Imagine what it would be like without transmissible diseases and pestilence 
and living to be 150 to 200. Our lives have been drastically cut short in this realm since the past reset. It's time to take our longevity back. Bless you all. Here's a quick Tartarian translation, and I wonder if any of these ruins are anywhere. So it says, Iki Birch and Koton, or destroyed great idols in Tartaria. In particular, it is said of these four ruins located in the Mughal Desert that Iki Birchan Khotan, or Day's Journey Eastward from another Trimming Zing, is an old ruined city in a ruined place. And I'm going to go to say this is pretty ancient. And whatever religion this is, which was referred to as idolatry by the Jesuits, I wonder where it has its place in reality. There are a lot of similarities to Hindu religion, but it also seems very different, too. So I wonder what they did and what this was like in its prime with powers going everywhere. Were these idols coming to visit? Were they experiencing psychedelic mastery in other dimensions? But something was going on here before these Tartarians were wiped out. Women in Florida are great and very wise and colored like men and pinked on their bodies, legs, and arms, putting such color into the places that will not easily come forth. But the women, kind when they come first into the world, are not so black but very white. The black-yellowish color is made upon them by a certain ointment, as the Tartarians and other heathens used to do, which ointment they used to make of a certain ceremonial oil by them used. Their color likewise changes because they go naked and with the burning heat of the sun. The women, likewise, are very quick and agile, like the women of Egypt, and can swim over great rivers, holding their children fast under one of their arms, and will likewise climb up the highest trees that are in all those countries. Found in a book from the I-500s or 1500s by artofdino.com. Check it out. March 1936, boy missing in dust storm appears after night in open in Two Butts, Colorado. Three-year-old Steve Benson walked into a farmhouse today after spending the night lost in one of the worst dust storms ever to strike this area. More than 500 persons were searching for the boy, expecting to find him smothered or frozen to death when he reached the farm home of Dewey Fetters, six miles from where he disappeared yesterday afternoon. I slept out, he said, saw the cows. Almost immediately he fell asleep. Doctors examined it and said his condition was exceptionally good considering that he had been in the open hours in a dust storm that reduced visibility to zero. He was taken to a hospital. Veteran residents of the Dust Bowl were amazed that the child lived through the night. The temperature dropped to below freezing and the boy was clad only in overalls. He had lost his shoes and sand burrs were stuck in his flesh. Pretty intense that this happened and this is just again during that time of the dust storms where whatever was going on outside this area we do not know. But new theories are Forming. Thought this was interesting. I used Bing Image Creator with Juice's Dal E3, and I wanted to find out things like God, Heaven, Hell, and the Devil. So take a look at these. These are the AI representations of just the word God in the prompt. These are the AI representations of Heaven, which is all very interesting. It's kind of crazy in if you examine it as you would an artist, how the animal, the eagle, flying, flight, and all this light represents God, and how heaven is represented kind of in a very beautiful and detailed way. But hell is represented kind of like the White House and the Capitol building. Pretty interesting. And also a bunch of different uh, cities with the devil, really evil, really descriptive devil there. And then you type in hell and you get this absolutely comical nonsense thing. So very interesting to see how and analyze how AI as an artist thinks because the same people pulling AI strings are trying to pull ours, but we won't let them. April 1913, gold dust makes soft water available everywhere. I thought this was very interesting. Every woman knows the luxury of having soft water at her command, especially for washing clothes, but nature has denied this luxury to many, especially to those living in cities or in hard water countries. However, every woman can have soft water in her home with little trouble and less expense. The sprinkling of gold dust washing powder in the water from your taps or well will make it as soft as the rainwater that falls from the clouds. Gold dust takes out the mineral substances that make the water hard and brings out the greatest cleansing value. 
very interesting. Let the gold dust twins do your work. So this is a company selling gold dust as a cleaning solution. And if gold had the power to do this in your water and stuff, imagine what it did when its buildings and everything was everywhere and it was used in so many more products than we can fathom. Again, one of the miracles of nature that they have robbed us of in this present time and replaced with toxic nonsense and garbage. The Cairo Bulletin, August 17, 1907, Cairo, Illinois. The invention of felt. According to Professor Beekman, felt was invented before weaving. The middle and northern regions of Asia are occupied by Tartars and other populous nations, whose manners and customs appear to have continued unchanged from the most remote antiquity, and to whose simple and unformed existence this article seems to be as necessary as food. Felt is the principal substance both of their clothing and of their habitations. So very interesting how felt was basically the uh, the source, the shelter for all these tartars and they invented it and they came up with this idea, all their clothing, all these things that we use today. You find it in so many stores, people are crafting with it everywhere and no one knows that it originated from Tartary in the most remote antiquity time period in ancient times with the, some of the greatest people to ever walk the earth. This is from an article in 1930 where they are talking about different ideas for a Columbus, Christopher Columbus Memorial uh, Tower or statue. And look at these things. Go back and look at those. They have nothing to do with Christopher Columbus. They are weird, like obelisk-like things to glorify the lie. And there's many different articles that I've been founding where people were claiming he's not even close to from Genoa, all these other things, that he was a pirate, that the whole story is fabricated. Those stories litter the old newspapers, and I wonder what's the truth, because nothing they tell us is truth, especially when it's about something as serious and massive as an event of the founding of our entire land and all this continent, which they try to make us convince nobody in an ancient seagoing world was able to sail a distance that has sailed all the time with ease by people of all types and the lies just continue but Columbus deserved a memorial more like the ones I showed here instead of those others. May 1900 the most interesting place in Bokhara is the execution tower I had heard of it before but the matter had slipped from my mind and it was from the Amir himself that I sought information about it it is a finely constructed stone tower and its height of 250 feet makes it imposing I asked the Amir what it was when it caught my eye and he he explained that it was the execution tower. The prisoner contempt to death, he explained, was compelled to walk to the top and then step off. He went to a sheer plunge of 250 feet to the flagging below, and if he survived the flight through the air, his life was crushed out at the bottom. I expressed the opinion that it was a horrible punishment, but he seemed to think it quite as good as any other method and added that it made a fine sight. Yet a couple of prisoners condemned to die a week later, and with the true oriental hospitality, said that he would have them killed at once so that I might see just how the thing was done. However, I refuse. The Russian government has long contemplated doing away with the Tower of Death, and one of these days, that method of execution will be abolished. Yikes. June 15th, 1904. Boston man, a fellow kindred spirit who objects to accepted theory of the spherical Earth, keeps son from school and is fined. James Broom of Boston and the public school teachers of that city have several matters of difference, prominent among which is the matter of the shape of the Earth. The Earth is generally accepted that the Earth is round, if not endorsed by a broom. He holds that the earth is flat and is accustomed of a Sunday to expound his belief to an audience on the Boston Common. Broom has a son, also named James, who has been brought up after his father's ideas. He's registered as a pupil in the Dwight School and there is considered a very bright young man, in fact almost an infant prodigy. That is when he is present. Since last September, however, the youth has not been at regular school and attendance is desired by the teachers and as a result the father was brought up in court recently. He was fined. Young Broom and his father will continue to advance the flat earth theory during the summer. I used to go to Newbury Street and the Commons to sell flat earth style artwork. I'm glad I could keep the tradition going. Turns out a few days ago the Tennessee State Senate passed a bill banning the spraying of chemicals in their skies. The law bans, quote, intentional injection, release, or dispersion by any means of chemicals, chemical compounds, substances, or apparatus within the border of the state that has the express purpose of affecting temperature, weather, or intensity of the sunlight. 
Of the 30 senators, 24 voted in favor and 6 against. Whoever was against is a fool. Hopefully other states now follow suit. They better. It's not a conspiracy theory when they are actively banning it in law. So, yeah, everyone that denied us for years and thought, oh, that's just what planes do in the summer, in the winter. They do the same thing. It's just water vapor is an absolute moron and this should spread to every single state because we all need to get behind this and we need to make sure that they end this and we need to put these companies that do these chemicals out of business forever and restore our planet's true weather again.